see fantastic views of the night sky with the Explore One 70mm telescope with its blue simulated carbon fiber wrap. Experience spectacular views of the solar system or explore a close-up view of the landscape around you with the superior optics that generate bright, crisp images. With the 70mm aperture, two high-end eyepieces, alt azimuth mount, a fully adjustable tripod, and an accessory tray that keeps everything close at hand when in the field. Easy to set up and operate, the Explore One Carbon Fiber Telescope is the right choice for anyone starting out on a lifetime of adventure. Thank you for watching our 24 hour a day live stream here at Explore Scientific where we show you all the programs that we run live in front of a live audience. Programs like Global Star Party, On the Wing for Birders, First Light Chronicles for Beginners, and Focus on Astrophotography for Astrophotographers. We bring in astronomers and explorers from around the world to answer your questions live. But there's so much cool information there that we decide to package it all together and run it 24 hours a day. We're also on Amazon Live, uh, where we do deep dives into our products and our gear. There's so much important information as we share the education, the experience, answering questions from the audience, that kind of thing. So tune in, and thanks for watching. Thank you for watching. If you're in love with the stars, you love the Milky Way, and you want to be out with astronomers under a really dark sky, come to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party with Biosphere 2. It's going to be amazing. You'll be at Oracle State Park, Oracle, uh, Arizona, and we're going to have music, stars, astronomy, door prizes, a lot of fun. Come to explorescientific.com forward slash events and sign up. National Geographic CF600 PM Telescope lets you explore the intricate contours of lunar terrain or the brilliant clusters of Pleiades. Use the red dot finder to accurately line up this entry level scope with the alt azimuth mount and tripod to begin your journey into the world of amateur astronomy. The 90 degree diagonal mirror assembly makes viewing comfortable and the built in storage trays keep your two included eyepieces safe and secure. The easy to use telescope lets you see clearly with an aperture of 50 millimeter with a 600 millimeter focal length and the unique carbon fiber styling of the CF 600 PM gives this scope a modern rugged edge. Use the included online astronomy software and Star Map with the National Geographic CF 600 PM telescope to begin your journey to exploration of the stars. From our National Geographic series, the Explorer NT 114 CF Newtonian Astronomical Telescope is a perfect portal into the realm of deep sky observation. Offering a 114 millimeter aperture and 500 millimeter focal length, the telescope comes with two plossal eyepieces that produce images with excellent definition and contrast. The set also includes an adjustable tripod and a red dot viewfinder. Just add clear dark skies on a moonless night and you're set to explore the universe with the National Geographic Explorer NT114CF Newtonian Astronomical Telescope. Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific. Okay. Last time, uh, when we were talking about how to make astrophotographs with your telescope, this is for beginners, or for anybody that wants to start off making astrophotographs, maybe with a smartphone, uh, we talked about the importance of, you, of getting perfect focus.
Dang it. What happened? Did it come on? Yeah. Sweet. Welcome back, guys. Welcome to another edition of Facebook Live. Tyler here with Explore Scientific. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today's going to be kind of an easy episode uh, because easy's easy. We're going to talk about the first light series. I believe this, uh, this does not look like an e NT114, but we're going to talk about the Newtonian here on a German equatorial mount. Also, we're going to talk about this beautiful, uh, this is the 8640? Or is this the 102? Paul, is this the... What? You're asking the wrong man. You, 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 you should know this. Now, I should know this. It looks like the 80, but I don't... It, it may be the 102. It's longer. I think it's the 102. So, you know, Newtonians and refractors. You know, why, why do beginners... What's the, what's the issues with these two? Not really issues. What's the benefits of these two? You know, if you, you got ask me the difference between a sure this and a sure microphone. That, exactly. I can answer that question. You Is ask it, me telescope questions. It's the same thing. I say that thing looks at the sky and that one looks at the sky. So here's or your the, neighbor. Yeah, oh Lord, why do we gotta look at the neighbor for? But yeah, Paul, Paul knows, if I have an audio question, I go to Paul. Paul knows all the audio stuff from a Sure microphone, Yeti microphone. Photography, hard photography, yeah, hard questions, photography. Not astrophotography, no. actual photography. No, I don't know. I, I know photography enough to make it frustrating for anyone who knows astrophotography. Because it's not, not the same. It's, it's the similar? concepts are the same. The sort light of, yes. is light. But light that's is light, it. but with astrophotography, we were wanting to be wide open, but with photography, and you're wanting to close that iris and get nice, yeah, nice sharp pinpoint stuff. But you know, for beginners, we all got to start from somewhere. We either started with a, a Newtonian style telescope versus a refractor, and then you got a German equatorial mount versus just a normal panhandle, uh, panhandle mount, you know. Um, both great things about the Explore Light First ex, bleh, bleh, ex, <laughs> Explore Scientific First Light series is Explore Light. Uh, they all come with red dot finders. They all come with uh, 25 millimeter super pilosals, and they all come with if it, like a refractor, they come with a diagonal. So you're an amount, of course, amount, and and you're basically getting started. Uh, they could be ranged from anywhere from basically under 500 bucks, depending on, well, on these two, I believe they're under 500. <laughs> Don't quote me on that because I could be wrong. Um, but these, these are great for beginners. Uh, these are a step up from the <sighs> toy side, in my opinion. The optics are a whole lot better. Some of the main complaints that I, I've seen a lot of on Newtonians is when I'm looking at trees or just you know the a field. It's up. Why is it upside down? I'm confused. I'm looking straight at it, but it's upside down. It's because the mirror that's in here is flipping it because it's at a 45 degree. So light's coming in, coming back, and it goes right into your eyepiece. So how it works? Does it make that this. noise every time? I may have to m maneuver this so Paul can see it, or so the audience can see it. I'll wait and so yeah, that's good, perfect. Got it, got it, good. So light literally comes straight in through this wonderful hole. This is the objective. One of the main problems that we have here at Explore Scientific is I can't see anything. Paul, do you know why we can't see anything? Because you're blind. Could be. What else could be the reason? <laughs> Hello, Ivan. How are you doing, sir? Welcome to another edition on Facebook Live. Lens cap is on. Now, Same thing with a photography you, camera. Why is it black? Oh, crud. My lens cap's on. <laughs> but you could take yes. the inside with this, cap off. With this one, say you're looking at the moon, Paul, you know? And when you're looking straight in, you're getting all that blinding light come in. You're like, ah, oh, it's too bright. Oh, God, I can't see nothing. Yeah. You, you take this off and it lets in just a little bit. You're not getting a whole, you're not getting flooded with freaking uh, moonlight. You're just getting a portion. 
a smaller portion. You but can you, still see out of it. Go ahead. You want to make sure that it's not right over top like it is right now. It's right over top one of the the uh, oh, our, the uh, veins. The yeah. Yeah. Good call. Good catch. And Paul's correct. You don't want to make. You also want, like you said, there's there's veins in here that hold the secondary mirror, which is here, and then you also have the primary mirror. And I got to turn this. I can see it. Well, in the back. Yeah. Here's the, so how how Newtonians work is light comes reflector. straight down through here. Newtonian so, is a reflector, right? Yes, it reflects light. So light comes straight down the tube, hits the mirror in the back, and it hits that secondary mirror, which is angled at like a 45 degree angle. Here, and I'll show you right here. I'll turn and now uh, I gotta keep loosening. Oh, that's the wrong way, Tyler. We need to take another picture of you because your hair, you needed a haircut. I know, my, my, my hair is crazy today. No, on the picture. Oh, yeah. Plus, you don't have an Explore shirt on. No, I don't. Can you see? Because you didn't have any. No, we didn't have, we just got these in. Right. What's wrong? So I'm trying to, can you see the mirror? That secondary mirror? Uh, Down no. here? Let me check the other camera. No. Okay. Just a little bit. Let me try to, we're zoomed in about as good as we're going to get. Okay. Well, that's fine. Well, there, I can see a reflection, out. but there's a mirror where that secondary is and it's angled oh. at, at 45 degrees and it bounces the light straight to the eyepiece which is here. So I'm gonna rearrange that so Paul can see it. There he goes. I'm gonna give him a minute. That's fine. Switching the camera, folks. Switching the camera. This is very highly technical stuff without Paul. No, it's, it's totally fine, bud. As long as I can see it, which, yeah, I can see you literally walk through. So in there is the secondary. That's what you see. And what it does is down. it looks down the primary. So you got light coming in, hits the primary lens, comes right back up, hits the secondary, out through the objective for the eyepiece. That's how Newtonians work. Now there is a, another, um, I don't know, I'd have to get with Kent, but unfortunately Kent's not here. There's, they're called Bird, Bird Jones, Bird Jones style um, telescopes. And that's I have never heard of those. Yeah, it's 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 a it's another acronym for reflectors. But with the reflector, gives you a little bit more reach. You you do have to mess with collimation. That's just that's just the nature of the beast on reflectors. You have to mess with collimation. So if you're not comfortable with collimation, you don't know what collimation is, it's where you're having to align the secondary with the primary so you can get a nice corrected image when it goes off into your eyepiece. If those are not aligned properly, your stars are going to look funky. Your objects that you're looking at are going to look weird. They're going to look a little distorted. Like they're, they're not in focus in a sense. They're just slightly out. It's like a bad pair of binoculars that get whacked pretty good. They, they looks like double vision, kind of, in focus. That's kind of what the same thing is with this one. Now with a German equatorial mount, is it's recommended that you point it north, depending on where you are in the, on Earth, actually. Uh, you point it north, depending, and then you also adjust the latitude of where you currently are. Here it is 36 degrees in northwest Arkansas. So I, and north is literally right behind me. So I would literally point this north every night after I adjust it because it's crooked. Uh, that's about as good as I'm going to get it. I would point it north, and then what I would do is say I want to look at Deneb, which is to my left or the east. I would literally. Tyler. Yes, sir? Pekka doesn't believe that we're live. Pekka. Every day he's I got I hate to, to be the bearer of bad news. Today is Wednesday, July 27th, because it's my oldest kid's birthday, and I'm right here pinching myself. We're live. I mean, do we need to see Paul pinch myself? Because I'd rather not. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I don't I, want him to That's either. not in my contract. Yeah, that he knows of. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so what I'll I do read it. is I'll point. Sometimes if you want to speed this along is you release the clutch, turn it, lock it back down, 
and then you can fine, man, fine, fine tune it. And then I'm just going to take the RA and turn it. And then what I'll do is once I find my object in my red dot, I'm just going to slowly turn. Just, just follow the object throughout the whole night. That's it. I'm, going, I'm not going to have to do anything. I don't have to do nothing but just turn the RA axis. That's completely it. That's it. That's honestly it. That's as it's, it's easy as that. Now, I don't know if I'm going to put Paul on the spot, but I'm going to give him a little bit of time. If We're going to talk a little bit about polar aligning, but I'm going to leave it to Kent because Kent does an amazing video with a broom. Um, he actually, he's in Nebraska right now doing a star party, and he did uh, the broom method or the compass method, um, which I believe he has the compass in the video, if I'm, if I'm right, Paul, doesn't he? Does he use the compass or no? Is it just the broom? I can't remember if it was the compass or the broom. Anyway. That's why we need pre-production meetings. What is that? We, if we fly off the cuff here. So, but he can literally polar align with a, either a magnet or, yeah, he uses a magnet, or magnet, a uh, compass. Um, so he's in Nebraska. He literally did a compass polar alignment. And what you'll do is you'll stand far enough back, probably about 10 feet from the mount, or five, five to ten feet from the mount, you hold the compass up in your hand, pointing north, and you'll sit there and just, with, it's usually recommended with two people, that way you can have someone messing with the tripod, and one person just telling you left or right, or whatever. So he'll sit there and hold it, the compass flat out in his hand, with one eye, but if you got one of those military style ones, it's got a little uh, piece of wire that you close up and you can see through it, it's glow in the dark. Um, you'll sit there and hold it to your eye at eye level, and you'll tell him, all right, left, right, left, right, bang on. And he literally slewed to the sun, and he stuck on the sun, I think, for six hours before he had to pack it up. Well, at least the solar side, um, the solar scope side. But I'm going to let Kent talk more about it for sure. So, Kent, take it away. Hey, everybody. Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific. Today I'm going to teach you how to polar line your telescope using a broom. Why do you need to polar line? Well, with a telescope that has an equatorial mount, you have to get that equatorial axis lined up with the rotation of the Earth. And to do that, we're going to start with the tripod. We're going to decide which one of these legs is going to point north, and we're going to set the tripod down so that leg is pointed north. First thing I'm going to do is use a level to make sure my tripod is level, so if it's tipped one side or the other, that's going to cause your polar alignment to not be accurate. So we're going to use a level for that purpose. Then we're going to take a compass, and just to make sure that I've got it pointed north, I'm going to use the compass line up and go, yep, that looks like it's pointed north. So here's what I'm going to do now. And this is where the broom comes in. The broom becomes a measurement device, if you will. So I'm going to put the broom on the ground with the tip of it right against the north leg of the tripod. And I'm going to back away and I'm going to use the compass. I'm going to close one eye and I'm going to use the compass to make sure that the broom is lined up with north, right? And so I can tell I'm off just a little bit. So I'm going to move the tripod just a little bit and I'm going to turn the broom and the broom is what I'm seeing that line with to line up. So closing one eye, now my broom is lined up perfectly to magnetic north. Right here is we're going to talk about something called magnetic declination. The magnetic north is not true north. The difference between true north and magnetic north can be off by as much as 15 or 16 degrees if you live on the east coast or west coast of the United States. Around the world it varies and you have to figure out what that is for where you live. Because if you point at magnetic north, you're not going to be pointing at true north. You can be off by 15 degrees. Your go-to will never be accurate. So for this system to work, you have to know what that offset is and be able to program that into your compass. We're going to provide a link to a, a, a website and a video that talks about that a whole lot more. Now, we're going to make sure that the tripod is not angled and wrong. I'm going to use a small tape measure and we're simply going to come down here and be careful not to move the broom and I'm going to measure the distance from the tripod leg to the center of the broom that is 470 centimeters that way 
it is 470, a little, I'm going to call that good. Actually, I'm going to move the tripod a couple of millimeters just like that. So now we know that we're lined up true north with that leg, and these two legs are the equal, are the equal distance from right here. So it's not pushed that way or that way. So now that we have the tripod with a good alignment to north, we have to put the head on the mount. And that's going to entail this. We're going to be very careful when we do this because we don't want to move the tripod. We're going to put it on and simply screw on the polar head just like this. Remembering everything's going to the north. Now if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to do the same thing. You can do the same exact same in the southern hemisphere because it's not polar, it's polar alignment, we just don't use the star Polaris, which we're not using here. This is really good if you can't see Polaris, or if it's daytime and you want to do some solo, solar viewing with a solar safe filter. So the last step of this process is to check the scale of your altitude, right? So we live at 36 degrees north, and I am going to turn the altitude until it gets to 36 degrees north. I'm going to stop. And that's it. With this system, using a broom, a compass, and a tape measure, you can achieve a good, decent starting polar alignment. Personally, I've used this, and I've got an amazingly close polar alignment. There's ways that you can use to refine your polar alignment, specifically drift alignment. But it all starts with a good, polar alignment. You can do this in the daytime. You can do this in the nighttime if you can't see Polaris. It works all the time. It's a good way to get started learning the process of polar alignment. Isn't that great? I hope you've enjoyed this video. For Explore Scientific, I'm Kent Martz. Get out there and start doing astronomy and keep looking up. Hey guys, welcome back. Appreciate it, Kent, for all the wonderful advice that you always bestow upon us, even when you're not here. It's amazing. It's honestly amazing. And Pekka, we're still alive. We are still alive. Just checking. Just checking if you're still there. So let's go over the refractor here. I believe, again, I'm, I'm going to have to, I think this is the 102. I think. The, there's no comment. All I see is my ugly mug. There, it just came up. Just came up. You get more precise north if you do a magnetic declination from your beginning. I recommend an app for iPhones that shows how many degrees of geological north is from magnetic north. True. It's true, Pekka, but you're also getting into more the technical side of it. Um, Kent's purpose is just for beginners. You're just getting it started and getting it done. Um, but, I mean, I still like your idea. I really do. I need to get you on the show that you can actually show us how to do that. For everybody. So the 102. I'm going to call it the 102. The one, yeah. Uh, actually, it's more precise if you use the short knobs and you get more precise tracking. Are you talking about the short knobs? Are you talking about the stubbies on the NT114, Pekka? Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about polar alignment? Because I'm confused. I'm going around and around. So the 102. Yep, I'm waiting. Hey, Osmosis. Howdy, Internet peoples. How you doing, sir? Or ma'am? I'm not sure. Um, the 102 comes with the panhandle. Uh, it's real simple to use. You can literally just point this wherever. I have an object I want to look in the south. I literally just point at it. And then I can just unlock the lever that's here by twisting, and I just move it. I literally all day, all day long, just everywhere, just wherever I want it to go. It's very simple to use, great for beginners. Again, it's the first light series, so it's going to come with a super, a 25 millimeter super colossal, a diagonal, the red dot finder, the mount, and of course, the telescope. Now, the main difference on these telescopes is you have a lens cell grouping up front, and it just soaks the light in, it fo gets it to a focus point, and then comes down the tube into the diagonal, up the eyepiece and it's a lot easier to do. That's why I always recommend, you don't have to mess with collimation as much. 
Um, it is still recommended just in case, but if you take care of your equipment, you won't have to worry about collimation at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, with the First Light Series, this refractor... Uh, well, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, Dag nabbit, Paul, I lost my train of thought. With this refractor, uh, the, the First Light Series refractors in general, there are doublets. Uh, what are you going to expect to see with a doublet? Well, I mean, you can see planets. Sometimes. Focus. 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 Ah, it's taking a minute. And there it goes. Uh, I didn't know what to focus on. I moved. Um, the moon will look great in this refractor. Same with the Newtonian. Some planets, uh, depending on your seeing. Pluto, probably not. Pluto's a, a, to be honest, Paul, you can see Pluto. It looks like a star. <laughs> it's so tiny. It's so, so tiny. But if you know the trajectory of the RA and the deck of where it's going to be at, and you know the time where it's going to go over, <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> oh, boy. He's laughing, folks. Ha! It's a bearded truck driver from Iowa. He enjoys burgers. It might actually be the first time I've called him ma'am. There are worse things. <laughs> or worse things. We're glad to see you stopping in, Osmosis. We appreciate your, your time and hanging out with us when all the fun starts. So with a doublet, what, you, what can you expect to see? You can see um, M42, which is Orion's Nebula. You can see that really well. Now, if you don't like chromatic aberration, you're going to get it with a doublet. You're going to get it with this. Now, what is chromatic aberration? Uh, chromatic aberration is a, you got colors that are coming into the focus tube, right? And they're hitting the lens cell. Not all of those colors can be focused. Like, we'll just use green, blue, and red, for instance. Uh, but there's a whole lot more. All those colors can't be focused to one pinpoint of light. One of those colors are going to be a little much or a little too much or not focused in enough. And it's usually blues and purples. So that's why if you look at stars or you look at the moon, planets, um, you'll see a blue tinge actually around those objects. And there's no defect or anything wrong with the telescope. That's just the, the it can't focus all of that light into one focal point. So it's completely normal. Some people don't even, don't even see it. Some people are actually colorblind to purple or blue, and they don't even notice it. And if you decide to use this um, for imaging, you actually don't see it in a monochrome camera because you process it out. And you can do the same thing with actually one-shot color or DSLRs. You can process the whole thing out. Where's Scott going? Scott went to Alcon. It, it don't... You had to ask me, didn't you? It's an astronomical league convention um, in Albuquerque. Yes. Uh, I, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I know he's, he's broadcasting some of the, uh, uh, the speaks, or the guest speakers. Uh, the speaks, yeah. Speaks. Speaks the squeaks. No, you don't want that. You don't want that at all. Nah, well, we still don't want that. There might be children watching. Uh, we all are, me, Kent, and Scott. No one talked to you, Siri. I'm on, I don't know why she came on. I'm on theater mode. Uh, it's on theater mode. It's on theater mode. She was... Darn thing. Paul's got all the problems. <laughs> He's experienced all the problems. But... And the Biosphere 2. It's kind of the Oracle State Park slash Biosphere 2. Um, which actually, you know what? Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Oh, I plan on, on Amazon. Make sure you stop in over there. We're going to talk about the Planetsphere, the moon maps, what solar. What have been doing? Kim and I have been doing. We've just been running straight into everybody and not stopping. Well, then let's just continue on this Mosian train. I just run the intro again and come back. That's all I do. Is go ahead and all right. It, it is really dark. I have never been to Oracle State Park. Hopefully, um, the last time I went to, uh, uh, it was in Kenton, Oklahoma, with Kent. Yeah, Kenton with Kent. 
Uh, we took, I took my oldest boy with me. Um, that's when my, I had my back issues. It wasn't very enjoyable for me. Um, I can't stand, I couldn't stand, couldn't walk in any position I got in. I was just, com I, I was completely uncomfortable for 11 and I, almost 12 hours of driving one way. It was very uncomfortable, but I, I did it for my kid. When you promise your child that you're going to do something, I, I do it even if I have a busted back. Um, so we're going to go to Oracle State Park in Arizona, which is a Bortle 2, I believe. Um, so I'll be able to see. What? Uh, there are some Bortle 1 skies in within the states, but it's they it's yeah. But if you want Bortle 0, the problem is there is no such thing as Bortle 0 because even space is bright. Well, the moon. Yeah, the moon. The it's, moon's it's, gonna. It's constantly saying, "Hi, I'm still here. I'm still I'm still bright as How'd ever." That go again. Yeah, hi, I'm still here. Oh my God. So, right. so Scott did a little promo for it. Do you want to watch that? Yeah, let's watch that promo, and then we're just going to roll right into the beautiful Amazon. Oh, we still got about five minutes. Yeah, do it to it. I'm going to go to the... <clears throat> Where is Scott? <clears throat> Under a really dark sky, come to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party with Biosphere 2. It's going to be amazing. You'll be at Oracle State Park, Oracle... Uh, Arizona, and we're going to have music, stars, astronomy, door prizes, a lot of fun. Come to explorescientific.com forward slash events and sign up. There we go. That was you it. Gotta pay attention. You gotta pay attention. Where I gotta be quicker than that. He didn't give me cues. Those, well, I <laughs> that's told fine. you. you that's fine. I, I, I had to take care of some business. Um, <laughs> but that's so, Facebook. Well, we're gonna roll this no, we're just going to keep rolling. So we're just gonna keep actually, rolling? The feed doesn't die. The feed does not die, but I see a comment from Osmosis. I can see it. We're just going to start back over the with pink the NT. Floyd, dark the pink side, Floyd, dark of, the side of the moon. Every person is differently through glad. <laughs> Perfecto. Okay. So, since we're basically starting back over again, let's roll that beautiful bean footage. See, that's why we should do like news and stuff for the Facebook. And then roll everybody into products because now's the time to ask questions that may require deeper answers because of the limitations put upon us by Amazon. Amazon. Oh. Amazon. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can ask questions. They have every right to ask questions, but depending yeah. on how technical those questions are, may be for a different topic. Yeah. Uh, some, sometimes, you know, we run into that a lot. And it's okay. There's, Name it's, the game. We're not mad about it. No. It's just, you know, whatever. Yeah. So Newtonians. You know, Paul, what? Have you taken out a Newtonian before, ever? I, I took out the toy one. Okay. So the difference between, a, as Paul puts it, the toy one and the Explore First Light is better quality graphics, better quality scope. Uh, I mean, and, and focuser, obviously. And you get a and mirror with it. Say again? And the mirror. The mirrors are all, well, yeah. Uh, the, I was, I was getting, definitely getting there. I appreciate it. Um, well, the one I took is that blue. Uh, oh, you took the Aurora? Explore one. Yeah, the Aurora. Yeah, the, the extreme entry level. Yeah. You know I mean? When Paul's meaning extreme entry level, under $100. Just under hundred bucks. Yeah. Which there's nothing wrong with those. I like the tripod it comes with, though. Yeah, it's got a nice tripod. It, I, I, I can't. The slow it. motion controls and the whole deal. Yeah. It's like I like that. It is. It's definitely handy for a beginner for sure. But what was the as, as customer service? Or I deal with customer servers, customers, and customer service. Uh, one of the main issues that we get a lot with Newtonians or any type of telescopes is I can't see anything out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I, I literally can't see anything out of it. All right, I got so. My, I got my eyepiece in there, and, you know, I can't, I can't see nothing. What's the deal? All right, do you want to move into Amazon now? Oh, I was, I was actually, I thought I know. I thought so I'm stopping you. Yeah, go ahead, bud. So we're, we're right up against it, 2 o'clock. Yep. I, I open it up immediately. Go for it. So right just, now we've got just seconds. Seconds? Yeah, Thirty seconds 30 before we seconds. go live on Amazon. Amazon. 
So now is the time that you give us any links or forwarding or off-site stuff. So if you guys want to stick around for a Friday show for Focus on Astrophotography, we're going to have Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock is a genuine artist with a DSLR. He can do Three, light paintings. He can do all two, sorts of stuff. Mac Murdock is his name. Hmm? Welcome back, folks. This here is another wonderful edition of Amazon Live. Today's date is Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. Yes, that's right. We're still live, folks. I know, Paul's Sometimes. always sighing. He's always sighing. Today we're going to talk about a Newtonian. That's my shtick. I know it's your shtick, you know, man. It's <laughs> what I do. I sit back here. I'm like the two old guys He's two at now. the Muppet Show. He's two old people. The, the two old guys at the Muppet Show that sit up there and make fun of everything that's going on. I don't feel strings, though, so I guess I'm good. I don't have attachments they to the Puppet They didn't have strings. Are they they, they had those little black oh, wires. They had little sticks. Yeah. And sticks. So we're going to talk today about... When you understand my role on this play, on this show, yeah, I mean, know. I'm not here to give you advice or fix stuff. That's true. I'm here to just make you feel awkward about your own existence. I don't need your help for that, buddy. <laughs> I do that enough on my own. So Nothing's again, ever personal that goes on. It's just, it's just shtick. It's just Paul. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm this way in real life. Yeah. But if you have a problem, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but not, anyway, back to our wonderful show. We I'm have not a little here to Martha make Stewart you cry, Tyler. Dr. Phil moment. I'm not here to make you cry, Tyler. Trust me, I never cry. Oh, you cry. Nope. <laughs> We're going to talk about telescopes. This is one of the main things that we get a lot of comments on are telescopes. So I got two different style of telescopes on different style mounts. We have a Explore First Light Series Newtonian and an Explore First Light Series Refractor. We'll get to that one here in a minute. You know what? We get, I, I run customer service here at Explore Scientific or help run customer service here at Explore Scientific. We get a lot of questions from customers that receive their brand new scope and mount. They get it all assembled following the, the instructions. But then, Paul, they can't see anything. They always ask, can't see nothing. I don't know why I can't see anything. I've assembled it just like the instructions tell me to, but I can't see anything. So I'm going to sit here and turn the scope around on the deck axis and see if the audience can notice anything that's wrong with this picture. Ah, you're correct. Dust cover's on. Yeah. You'd be amazed. How many calls we get on that here at Amazon as well? I can't see anything. And our wonderful Amazonian rep, <laughs> Noah Menard. He just called you an Amazonian rep. Yep. Don't he don't care. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> Noah sends, he, he talks to me and Annie a lot uh, about uh, some customers that have issues with their stuff. We're his go-to people um, on answering questions quickly and efficiently for Amazon, but you'd be amazed how many people forget to take off this wonderful thing called a dust cover. But it, it, it's, it has a different use to it. Though. But it does have a different use. You are correct, It is Paul. not just for looks and It's giggles. not just for covering things. And embarrassment. And embarrassment for, for the neighbor, or as Paul puts it. Are you leaving it on? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so say you want to look at the moon, right? And you don't want to take in all that light because I'm telling you, the moon at full bright, at full moon is bright, bright, bright. It'll blind you if you're not careful. There is a secondary cover right there. 
Hot diggity dog, I have a secondary cover. You got it wrong again. Did it, did, is it covering it? Dag nabbit. You got to make sure you don't cover the spider vein on here. We'll go over that here in a second what a spider vein is, or what I call a spider vein or a vein. Um, the secondary cover here is to not let as much, it's less concentrated or, or it's not as concentrated anymore as far as the light instance. Uh, the fact is that you're, you're blocking off a percentage of the mirror that's in the back here uh, so you don't get as much light, but you still, you can still see the object you're looking at. It's just not going to be as intense. It's going to be a little, it's going to be darker. It's kind of like using an ND filter on a, a camera. It just softens the image or softens the visual aspect of it. So you're not, ah, blinded by light. So that's what the secondary one is for. How Newtonians work, it's, it's, it's quite easy and it's quite simple. I'm going to turn to deck axis again is you have a mirror here in the back and you have a mirror in the middle of the tube that's going out towards the eyepiece here. So light comes in, bounces off this wonderful mirror here, comes back, hits the secondary mirror that's angled at 45 degrees and goes right into your optics train or your eyepiece. Now what Another also main issue that we've, we get a lot of complaints on is customers are, are going to try to line up their red dot finder, was, which what you do, and this scares people because they're confused, they think they're upside down for a minute, because when you're looking at it, you're, you're almost lost, is I'm looking at a tree line, and how I would do a red dot finder, um, aligning a red dot finder, is I would find an object within my eyepiece that's a good distance away, good distance away, 200 array. to array, 200 to 500 feet. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's good enough for what we're needing. So you would find the object in the center of the eyepiece, put it directly in the center of the eyepiece. You turn on your red dot finder, and then you have two switches, or, or not really switches, but louvers that control the laser that's back here to go up, down, left, right. So what you're wanting to do is what you're seeing in the eyepiece, you want to do the exact same thing here. You want to find that same object you're looking at and align that red dot right on that object so what this sees, you see out of this. So that way in the middle of the night, you don't have any issues finding things because what your red dot sees, it will pick up as well. But the thing that you need to remember is the more times you remove this from the telescope, you have to reset it every time. So if you can keep it together or in, intact in one piece, you don't have to mess with the collimation portion or the realigning of the laser as well, which is very, very important, especially if you're wanting to do long visual observing. You don't want to do this in the middle of the night when you're trying to reline your laser. It's just going to frustrate you. You're going to get mad. You're going to want to throw things. It's not going to be pretty. Do it during the day, folks. It's easy. It's daytime. You can see stuff during the day, and it's not hard. The manual says, uh, what, 300, 300 yards, 300 feet? Well, I, I did two to 500 feet. 200 feet to 500 feet. Yeah, but the further you can get away from, if the further away you can get, the more accurate. The more accurate it's going to be. So what I try to do is yep. I get it close. Yeah. This is what I learned when I did it, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So take a grain of salt. But when I did it, I got it close on like a stop sign or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, not too far away, street no. sign, a pole or whatever. And then I found, if I was up high enough, I found the closest line of sight of a uh, uh, cell phone tower. Correct. And then I got it put in the heavier eyepiece. Uh, more magnification? Yeah. Yep. And... Uh, then got as close as I have, as close as the eyepiece that I got. And this is during the day, of course. You don't do of this course. at night. You never do it. But, and then fixed it up that way, and it helped me out tremendously. Yep. Until I re realized that the uh, focus or, or the, 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 the finder that I had, because it wasn't a red dot finder. It was that can one that's on the 127 or oh, 102. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a regular straight through. Yeah, it, does, it wasn't focused, and it didn't focus, and it's broken. No, no, they focus. Now, no, we tried. Kent and I tried. It doesn't work. It's a floor model, so somebody goofed it up. It's, uh, it's all, well, then, yeah, that's, yeah. that's also possible. We, we have a showroom, and so they have stuff that sits out there, and people play with it. The junk stuff sits out there. Pretty much. The junk stuff. The stuff that people touch a lot, and they, they break, or we a put it out there. A return that's 
good enough to show people what's going on during the day. Well, they just show how, the, how everything works. Yeah, but it's not good enough to get sell, sell to somebody. Exactly, yeah. Paul, exactly. So, but yes, but I got it dead on in that crosshair. And I was able to, even though it wasn't in focus, as long yeah. as I was on a bright enough star, because when you're out of focus, you can't see the star a lot of no. times. Uh, as long as it was in focus, it was bright enough star, I could find it. Uh, and it was still dead on, which yeah. is really cool. I think that cell phone tower was about, oh, it was about a mile and a half, two miles away. Yeah, I, it gets the, it really close. In my backyard, there's when I try to do a red dot finder or a guide scope or just trying to focus some, on something. Um, I don't think you're going to get that close with the red dot finder, but you can with the guide scope. You can if you if you know what you're looking. Like if in the deadfall, I can see the water tower. It's five miles away. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about over there on the other side of... Yeah, over here by yeah. on the east of town, there's a water tower that's five miles from the house. And when the trees are gone, I can see it. Mm -hmm. And I just either try to align my guide scope with the, the main optical tube. That way I don't have any... We need to take one of these out to Petty Jean. Petty Jean? Mm. Mm. That's some really good photo opportunity of the scope, though. That's true. And it's a pretty dark sky. That is very true. It's probably a Bortle 3. No, well, we have to Google that later. Mm. So, we went over how Newtonians work. Ah! So, say you align, you're looking at your stop sign, right? But you're, you're confused. You look at it, well, it looks normal, but you look in here, it's upside down. Why is it upside down? I'm confused. It's totally normal. Don't freak out. It's okay. So, how it works is when the light comes in, bounces off the primary, and hits a secondary, whoop, it flips it. Is and it, it comes always out your do IP. that sound? Yep, whoop. Okay. That's how it does it. That would be quite annoying. Well, that's what I'm here for, annoyance. It's kind of like when you're here sometimes. No, it's to drive us crazy that's and keep us on our toes. Hmm. But, but that's it. It's just a normal image flip. It's totally normal. There's nothing wrong with your optics. There's nothing wrong with the telescope. It's completely normal. Binoculars do the same thing except they flip it back one more time. Yeah, they just they just flip it from right to left. They do it that way. This one does right upside down. Yeah. But they flip it back to normal and which is okay for binoculars, but if you're yeah. doing deep sky or something like that, you want you know, that's just an additional you piece of notice. glass. You won't know. <laughs> you can buy an adapter that will also flip it for you, too. Yeah, you, they make diagonals that are right angle image correction. Um, and they fix that issue, but you don't need it for a Newtonian. That's for refractors, not for Newtonians. I'm just saying, you can fix it if you want. You can. I agree with you. You definitely can. Uh, tripod with this particular mount is a German equatorial. The better tripod of the bunch. It but is if you're the doing better tripod stuff. of the bunch. If you're planning on eventually adventuring, eventually adventuring, that's adventuring a mouthful, eventually. If adventuring eventually into astrophotography, you're going to learn how to polar align. You're going to have to learn. Um, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, speaking of which, I believe Kent's left us a video before he left. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but with polar aligning, you point the RA axis, that's this axis right here, to the north. North's behind me, so I can't turn the scope. So we're going to pretend north's that way. Yep. So polar axis is facing north. You'll have a latitude adjustment down here at the bottom. You have to set your degrees of what your latitude is of where you are. Here in Springdale, Arkansas, it's 36 degrees. So I would set this indicator. It's like 100 that, outside right now. Uh, it is warm. You would set your indicator to what elev or not elevation degrees you were. So we're at 36 degrees. I crank it over to 36 until I get that angle. You can look in your eyepiece. You might see it. You'd be, you'd be surprised. There's actually a smaller star in Polaris that you can split, depending on the magnification that you can achieve with your telescope. Depends on your scene. And it does depend on your seeing, but so here's Polaris. We'll just here's Polaris. The tiny star is right. I mean, literally, it's right behind it. It's is real Polaris small. Polaris, an actual star? Yeah, there's. Yeah, it's a star. It's like, an ex, it's like a gas giant or something. All stars are gas giants. Ugh. Stop. <laughs> but no, really, because have we been able to get enough magnification on it to to actually discern that it's not just like a light planet? That I don't know uh, on that one, Paul. That's a good question for sure. Um, that's a Dr. Barth question. 
Mm -hmm. for a Monday for a Monday show on how do you know? Can't uh, try to answer it. And you know, just I, saying, Kent's better at this stuff than I am. <laughs> I'm just the face. That's all I am. I'm just the face, you man. You know what you're doing. So we're gonna roll. Kent's wonderful footage and how to polar align. He always calls it beans, but I, there's not one bean in it. What, the beautiful bean footage? Yeah. He's, he's the bean. Yeah, that could be true. <laughs> hey, everybody. Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific. Today I'm going to teach you how to polar align your telescope using a broom. Why do you need to polar line? Well, with a telescope that has an equatorial mount, you have to get that equatorial axis lined up with the rotation of the Earth. And to do that, we're going to start with the tripod. We're going to decide which one of these legs is going to point north, and we're going to set the tripod down so that leg is pointed north. First thing I'm going to do is use a level to make sure my tripod is level, so if it's tipped one side or the other, that's going to cause your polar alignment to not be accurate. So we're going to use a level for that purpose. Then, we're going to take a compass, and just to make sure that I've got it pointed north, I'm going to use the compass line up and go, yep, that looks like it's pointed north. So here's what I'm going to do now. And this is where the broom comes in. The broom becomes a measurement device, if you will. So I'm going to put the broom on the ground with the tip of it right against the north leg of the tripod. And I'm going to back away. And I'm going to use the compass. I'm going to close one eye. And I'm going to use the compass to make sure that the broom is lined up with north. right? And so I can tell I'm off just a little bit. So I'm going to move the tripod just a little bit. And I'm going to turn the broom. And the broom is what I'm seeing that line with to line up. So closing one eye. Now my broom is lined up perfectly to magnetic north. Right here is we're going to talk about something called magnetic declination. The magnetic north is not true north. The difference between true north and magnetic north can be off by as much as 15 or 16 degrees if you live on the east coast or west coast of the United States. Around the world it varies and you have to figure out what that is for where you live because if you point at magnetic north you're not going to be pointing at true north. You can be off by 15 degrees. Your go-to will never be accurate. So for this system to work, you have to know what that offset is and be able to program that into your compass. We're going to provide a link to a, a, a website and a video that talks about that a whole lot more. Now, we're going to make sure that the tripod is not angled and wrong. I'm going to use a small tape measure, and we're simply going to come down here and be careful not to move the broom, and I'm going to measure the distance from the tripod leg to the center of the broom. That is 400 and 70 centimeters. That way it is 470, a little, I'm going to call that good. Actually, I'm going to move the tripod a couple of millimeters just like that. So now we know that we're lined up true north with that leg and these two legs are the, equal, are the equal distance from right here, so it's not pushed that way or that way. So now that we have the tripod with a good alignment to the north, we have to put the head on the mount. And that's going to entail this. We're going to be very careful when we do this, because we don't want to move the tripod. We're going to put it on and simply screw on the polar head just like this. Remembering everything's going to the north. Now, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to do the same thing. You can do the same exact same in the southern hemisphere because it's not polar. It's polar alignment. We just don't use the star Polaris, which we're not using here. This is really good if you can't see Polaris or if it's daytime and you want to do some solo, solar viewing with a solar safe filter. So the last step of this process is to check the scale of your altitude, right? So we live at 36 degrees north. And I am going to turn the altitude until it gets to 36 degrees north. And I'm going to stop. And that's it. With this system, using a broom, a compass, and a tape measure, you can achieve a good 
decent starting polar alignment. Personally, I've used this and I've got an amazingly close polar alignment. There's ways that you can use to refine your polar alignment, specifically drift alignment, but it all starts with a good polar alignment. You can do this in the daytime, you can do this in the nighttime if you can't see Polaris. It works all the time. It's a good way to get started learning the process of polar alignment. Isn't that great? I hope you've enjoyed this video. For Explore Scientific, I'm Kent Martz. Get out there and start doing astronomy. And keep looking up. We're back. So Kent with wonderful information on how to polar align the German Equatorial Mount. I hope that was plenty of information uh, of, to help you get started with the German Equatorial and this NT114. Um, it's in the carousel, believe it or not, for 279 under 500 bucks. This will get you started, get you viewing, and get you going. So let's talk about the refractors, you know, what's... I personally like refractors. Uh, they're my go-to's. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Newtonians. These are just what I prefer because these are what I mess with the most of here at Explore Scientific um, and Amazon. Uh, there's, they're my go-to because with Newtonians, there's collimation. Uh, collimation is where you have to align the cell or not, they align the primary with the secondary. So you have to align two things at to get the focus right. They're not focused, but just get pinpoint stars, you have to align them. Uh, but they're still not facing the true north. But that is still not facing true north, right? Uh, Ramesh, that is, it's facing north. It's not, ah. Uh, so, for the sake of, yeah. For sake of production and the way our stage is set up, um, Whenever you're watching the video, no, it's not facing true north. Whenever Tyler or someone's on camera, no, it's not true north. Because... No, he's we, talking about true north or, yeah. or uh, magnetic north. Yeah, magnetic north, true north, whatever. It's, it's magnetic north. But I just wanted to make that clear because we do get that question a lot too. Yeah. That anything you see us do in the studio will not be north. But... You know, pretend. Let me know if that helped, Ramesh. And if you're talking about us. magnetic north versus true north, yeah. Kent uses the magnetic north with the compass. Yeah. That's the max magnetic north. <clears throat> like I said before, depending on where you are in your location, what you'll do is um, most, if you Google your true north versus your magnetic north of where you are, it will give you those in degrees. It will give you everything that you need to know on that specific spot. Uh, Kent would be able to give you more specific details. I just don't know it because I'm not a visual guy. I'm just astrophotography. Well, so shame on me. Okay, it was if, it was about Kent's video. Okay. If you need to get, I mean, you're going to get really close with yeah. magnetic north. So, unless you're doing astrophotography, you're you're not going to have to reset anything if you're on a motorized mount. It's going to keep up most of the night. You might, you know, yeah. might take a little bit, but not. We're talking half quarter, quarter of an eyepiece. You know? that, yeah, yeah. Depending on what you're looking at and what. But if you're doing astrophotography, you can get a good close, but then you're going to need to be a little bit more accurate whenever you get at night. There's this thing called plate solving. It makes yeah. it so much better. And inside of the Explore Stars. All you have to do is do a two-star alignment. Or three. The more, or star, three. more star alignment you do, the more accurate, yeah. accurate it will two be. Two or three-star alignment, and you're, and you're gold. It's so true. this is really just a setup. If you're doing the sun, you can't look through it. You know, you can't do this stuff because it's the sun. Where's yes. north? Right? Yep. So that's what this is for. Correct. So... Refractors versus Newtonians, like I said. No, you're fine, buddy. I appreciate your input and knowledge to help the wonderful viewers. It's because I hear this five days a week, twice every day. That's what you get paid for. For my entire ramble. life. I don't know about your entire life, but. Hi, Pekka. I see you. 
Um, so the difference between Newtonians and refractors, like I said before, is collimation. If you are not comfortable with collimation or don't know what collimation is, it's very simple. There's tons of YouTube videos out there. And we actually need to do a video here explaining how to do it. Um, with refractors, it's different compared to a Newtonian. You're actually aligning mirrors in the Newtonian. With this one, you're just aligning the angle of a lens. That's all you're doing. And Paul Newton's yo. He's talking. Yeah, he was talking. He's talking. He talks, he talks, it talks. Yeah, buddy. So, in my personal opinion, I like refractors. They're just easier to use. They're great for beginners, just like Newtonians. I just have a special heart for refractors. I really do. Um, with this particular setup on this 102, uh, same as any other first light that you get, comes with a red dot, diagonal, eyepiece, and a mount, and a telescope. So it comes with everything you need to get going on your visual, visual, adventure on the stars, the planets, anything you want to look at, galaxies or Messier objects, NGC objects, I see, well, you won't see I see objects. Um, no, no, just no, no. Um, could not help know, he, that. He couldn't resist. I teed it up. He smacked it out of the park. <laughs> Uh, Tyler promises ES solar foil filter that is giving an orange color of the, the foil filter that gives the orange color from the beginning and it's perfect for novice astro photography avoiding at the post process. You got it, buddy. You got what is it. it? He's talking about the solar filter behind me, uh, which we are going to go over that. Um, any of these scopes, you notice a wonderful sticker on the front of the dew caps. Come on, folks, say it with me what these stickers are for. We've told you time and time and time again. They're sticking to the dew cap. They're sticking to the dew cap. They have a specific purpose. Yeah. That purpose is never, ever, 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 ever point your optical tube assembly without or anyway, just don't point it at the sun. Yeah. Don't do it. Because the moment you do this and someone's on the other end of this optical tube with an eyepiece, Blind. Instantly. You can start no. stuff on fire with one oh, of these. Oh, yeah. You can definitely set some stuff on fire. And it's cool. I've done it. Don't do it. <laughs> it makes big boom. It makes big fire. Uh, we actually... And it ruins it a ruins lot of things. stuff. It ruins a lot of stuff. So... But the temperature in the eyepiece... Is double. It's almost... It's over triple of what... Like, if it's 100 degrees outside, it's about... 400 in that eyepiece just probably cooking, more or just cooking whatever it's trying to get yeah. through. Scott burnt those glasses remember yeah well here's here's the funny thing uh, me and a, a guy in QC we were ch we were just messing with a daub truss tube open open truss so it's it's literally light can come in from anywhere and we were wanting to look at the Sun yeah we know where this is going already so truss tubes are open right they're, they're, it's not a solid tube. The cage wasn't solid. It was completely open. Um, so we were wanting to look at the sun. So we put a big, we specially made a solar filter that goes over the secondary. So we had a big, big thing just like this. One of these sitting right over it. We still, here's the fun, we burnt a hole in the solar filter from the back end. Because yeah. the light was coming in from the sides, yeah. down on the mirror, it hit the secondary, and it was just blasting from the back end, this solar filter. Just all that power. As my, my little four-year-olds, every time I pick but him up if and If you would have put the shroud on it. Nope, wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> you don't think so? A nope. shroud? <laughs> mm -mm. It's That's not a blackout light. shroud. That's not huh? a blackout shroud. Yeah, but it wouldn't have been so bad. It, it wouldn't have been so hot. bad, but it, it, it melted the shroud, too. You didn't have a shroud on it. We did it. We, we put one on it, and then it melted it. Uh, the sun, sun is a dangerous thing. It is extremely dangerous. As my four-year-old says, every time I pick him up from daycare, and we go outside, and it's 100 and something degrees, the sun has too much power. It's too hot. That's how he knows. So he does an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. He's like, too much power. <laughs> too much power. That's my four year old. He's five year old. I'm sorry, not four year old. He's a five year old. Probably would. Yeah, he's, he's a great At kid. Four. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
But in my opinion, I like refractors because of their ease of use, especially with this mount, because you literally have a handle here that you just turn to lock, and then you turn to unlock, and whoop, I gotta move it around, and I can easily just move it very simply. So I can plop them out wherever I want to. I can prop, go in the front yard, I can go in the backyard, I can go on the sidewalk, I can go down the road to Aunt Jimmy's house or down over here to see Tim Bob. Doesn't matter. If I want to go look at the moon or whatever, I literally just plop it, move it, and I'm there. Don't have anything to worry about. But one recommendation I would always recommend, one recommendation I would always recommend, is align your red dot. So is that a recommend, recommended recommendation? That is a recommended for the recommended of the recommendation. <laughs> it's a recommended align this recommendation. During the day, please. If you align this during the night, you're going to be kicking, you're going to be screaming, you're going to hate life, and you're going to want to throw things because it is extremely hard. Because whatever, so the main, how to mainly do this or how, to, how we recommend to do it in the manual, um, if you want to align your red dot process, find an object in your eyepiece by pointing the telescope at whatever, stop sign, a tree line, a telephone pole that's at least between 200 feet to 500 feet. Give or take. You don't have to be there. It just gets you roughly there. But if you want more accurate red or an alignment for the red dot, go further. I usually go around 750 to a mile, 750 feet to a mile. That's how far I go. Miles way too much. You don't need to do a mile. That's just what I do. I have a water tower that's five miles from the house. And I align everything to that water tower in the dead of fall because all the trees are gone and I can see, I can see the dome top portion of it. And it's perfect for what I need it for. I focus it with a camera, done. I know it's in line and I'm good. So whatever you see in this objective, make sure that the mount stays locked and secured so it doesn't move because you're going to align the laser to that same thing you're looking at with here. Why do you want to do that? So you can find things a heck of a lot easier during the nighttime. Because I'm telling you, it can be a pain when this is off just ever so slightly and you're trying to find the moon and you're like, oh, this is a big giant bright thing. I can't miss this. You would be surprised how many people miss it because this is not in line with this. I always think, I always tell people, think of it as a rifle scope. If you're trying to get that big game hunting, if your rifle scope is off, you're going to miss. Doesn't matter how good you are doing anything, you're just going to miss. And that's what you don't want. You want to enjoy the views of the moon. You want to enjoy all the glory of whatever you're seeing. Now, with this particular type of refractor on the First Light Series, there are doublets. What is a doublet? I don't know if I can pull this off. I may not be able to. Remember, folks, I'm a trained professional. Maybe. It may not pull off. Ah, oh, there it goes. Breaking it. No, I didn't break it. Comes out. It's totally normal. There are two lens cells. That's right, two. One in the front, one in the probably one usually right up against it. What does that mean? Well, that tells you that it's a doublet. Now, the higher you get in prices, like over $1,000, those are usually triplets. It means there's three lens cells in here. There's one in the front, one in the middle. So you convex, concave, convex. That's right. I'll say it again. Concave, or I'm sorry, convex, concave, convex. So you have a dome shape in the this front. This one's a doublet, though. This is the doublet, so it's concave, or convex, concave. Or, I mean, it's, it's, it's opposite, it's convex, concave. And that's it. And that's, and what people notice with doublets is, say I'm staring at the moon, or a bright object, I, I notice, Paul, that I'm getting a lot of CA. Huh? What's CA? It's chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is a normal, everyday thing that doublets, doublets experience. It's completely normal. There's nothing wrong with your optical train. There's nothing wrong with the telescope. It's normal. It's part of it. We love helping customers. That's what we do here at Amazon Live. But I promise you folks, there's nothing wrong with your telescope. If you see blue or purple tinging, around the moon, around stars, or any other kind of celestial objects that you're looking at. Uh, it's the same thing with bi bi binoculars. Um, binoculars, 
sometimes produce chromatic aberration. Now what is chromatic aberration? So the lens cell in front can't focus all that light. We'll just use red, green, and blue, for instance. All of it though, all the beautiful colors. It can't focus all of them in one specific point to bring it down the tube so you can see it out your eye, the normal color that me and you normally see if you actually see true color and you're not colorblind. So it allows, it can only focus the reds and the greens, but the blues kind of, you know, he's, he's being a rebel. He doesn't want to focus in, right? So he kind of strays off at the end. And that's what you're seeing is that unfocused stray of light in the eyepiece in that blue or purple tinging. And it's, again, it's totally normal. Don't be upset. Don't be, oh, Noah, the, the, the guy from TV lied to me. He said that I should be able to see perfect with this, but I keep seeing blue or purple. But it's normal. It's totally normal. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. I don't know. I had to throw that in there. I don't know why. It's totally normal, though, folks. Chromatic aberration is a part of a thing, a part of everything thing. And the beauty part about these scopes is they're extremely affordable. You can check them out in your carousel. The NC114 is actually $279.99, I believe. And the refractor, there isn't a price on there, but I know it's under uh, $400 for sure. I know it is. So we're going to move on a little bit. Oh, with, this, with that particular mount, you, like I said earlier, uh, this one you had to polar align. You don't have to, but it's... If you're wanting to eventually grow up into astrophotography, this is what kind of a German equatorial you'll grow into for polar alignment. But the, this particular pan, panhandle type, you literally just plop wherever you want and just go. And there's no, you don't have to polar align anything, you don't have to do nothing, you just unlock the clutch, move it around in any way, shape, or form you want. So we have here, as well as a moon map. Why do I care about the moon? Because the moon actually helps us. Without the moon, would not be good. We would not be good. So on this particular moon map, there are actual landing sites of where we all landed. Same with Russia and China and I think that's it, just Russia and China. Or uh, I'm not familiar with the state flags. I do apologize. You got China. I believe that's not Russia. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that other flag is. Not entirely sure. No, do you know? Not entirely sure what that one is, but that's okay. I'm terrible. Is that Russia? It doesn't look like Russia. Yeah, Russian Federation ah, members different. So it is Russia. Hmm. And then God, I hope. I'm Chinese. So sorry. You got China, U.S., and Russia. This is it. Maps where exactly we landed as people on the moon, depending on which country. It gives you a detailed spot. And on the back side. This is more, I hate to say it, this is more interesting to me. Is this lets me know every crater, major crater out there. Because um, you got, you know, Mar, Mare Figurus, Pluto Crater, Mare Imbrium, Mare Insularum. I'm going to butcher these names. But yeah, Kent would be a lot better at this than I would be, for sure. Um, Moon maps are great for demonstration. They help you understand, you know, what the craters are. You get a better idea on, you know, what they, what it actually looks like. Kind of a full moon. Does anybody else see the bunny? Anybody else see the bunny? I see no. the bunny all the time. I blame Kent for this because I see the bunny all the time now. I have never seen the bunny. Well, I can't help your poor lack of imagination. I see a peace sign, maybe. No, you're getting there. So you got the bunny ears, and you got the two ears up top, the head, and the body. It's crazy. I blame Kent, only American man, but I'll put both foots on the moon. Exactly, Petka. Foots? Foots. It's foots. Feets. Feets, foots, feets, foots. Next thing is the glorious planisphere. Planispheres are very handy if you're doing visual observing. The reason being, it gets you more orientated with a night sky, and it's very, very helpful, especially if you have a crowd of people. And I believe Kent made a video on this as well. So we're going to let him explain it a little bit, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, so Kent, take it, up. take it away, buddy. It always does this to me. Was it locked up? 
Once you found Polaris, you're facing north. Hold the plan. Is it in the wrong bus? That's a long, that's an old one. Hi, I'm Kent Marsh with Explore Scientific. One of the great things about modern amateur astronomy equipment is the ability to track the sky with the use of a computer, an iPad, or an Android tablet, and a motorized mount like the Explore Scientific PMC-8. But what if you're just starting out or have a mount that is manually controlled? How do you find celestial objects? All you need is a clear sky and a Tyrian two-sided planisphere. This planisphere, created by renowned celestial cartographer Will Tyrian, is for the northern hemisphere. If you don't have one of these, you can find it in our online store. Some of our products come with a smaller planisphere that works like this one, but uses 24-hour time and Roman numerals. Honestly, I prefer this one because it's easier to read and contains tons of information. This planisphere is for anyone in the northern hemisphere up to 60 degrees latitude north. A planisphere works by aligning the month, day, and time to show what's in the night sky at any time of the night throughout the year. One side shows the northern half of the sky, while the other side shows the southern half of the sky. Now let's line up the date and time. Let's say it's 10 p.m. on August 25th. The first thing to do is find 10 p.m. and it will be in the blue portion of the planisphere, just inside the date ring. Move the date ring to the position on August 25th. Line up the August 25th mark to 10 p.m. You're done. Easy. You now have a map that shows what the night sky looks like in the northern hemisphere at 10 p.m. on August 25th. The cool thing about this Tyrian two-sided planisphere is that once the time and date are lined up on one side, it's also lined up on the other. Now we have to orient ourselves to make the map reflect what's in the sky. The North Star, which is named Polaris, is almost exactly due north and should be the brightest thing you can see in the, that area of the sky. Once you found Polaris, you're facing north. Hold the planisphere with the northern side facing towards yourself and position Polaris inside the metal ring so it shines through. Super easy. If you're facing south, simply hold the planisphere level with your eyes to get your bearings. With the map correctly oriented, you should be able to find your way around the night sky. I'm Kent Martz. Keep watching our channel for more how-to videos from Explore Scientific. And we're back. Kent with the wonderful information on how planispheres work. And that's the beauty part about this Will Tyrian planisphere is it's double-sided. Oh, well, Tyler, why do I need a double side for? It's like, well, if, what if I live in the southern hemisphere and I can't see some of the objects in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere? Wait. You want me to redo that again? That's not, no. Hang y on. Yes, it is. This is a double-sided planisphere. Yeah. North and south. Southern hemisphere. Not... Southern hemisphere. It's what's behind you, not on the bottom part of the earth. You want to make a bet? That's what Kent says every week. This has... Then Kent, one of you is wrong. That's all yeah. I know. i got to figure out. See, that's... This is the northern sky, because it's all the stuff that I normally see. And in the southern sky, these are th like Cetus. I don't. We never. I never see Cetus. Uh, Fulvahot. Never see it. And Kent's got it wrong. Then. Uh, Sagittarius. I mean, I mean, we see some of the same things, but some of the stuff we don't see. Period. He's saying this. He's saying. Here, hang on. No, you, you're good. Please. It's hard to explain. It's not hard. It's hard for me to explain. So here's what he's saying. He's saying when you get the, the uh, Polaris, right? Yep. And all you can see is on this horizon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you turn it, and now you see what's behind you. Yeah. Right? But the Milky Way comes from this direction. I, I, yeah. What you're implying is that somebody in... Uh, Brazil could use this and find stuff. They can't. Oh, me and the Kent are going to have to have a discussion for sure. Because there are objects on here that we cannot see here in the northern hemisphere. Well, I can't see them where I'm located at That's all. That's the way he's explained it to me and for weeks. And I don't know. That's all I know. So, yeah, we'll have some investig investigation to do. Is it I don't want to give the wrong, I don't want to give the wrong information here. Northern hemisphere planisphere. Say again, bud? Is it a world planisphere or a northern hemisphere planisphere? That's it's a double-sided multi-latitude for observers in the northern hemisphere looking north between the equator yeah, of see, zero just degrees. Northern hemisphere, it says right there. The northern hemisphere is... Okay, then. 
the it will not work the, for you in the south, southern hemisphere. That's weird, because there are southern objects in here, though. Sometimes they show up, I suppose. Yeah. Well, again, and that's what's that's what's odd to me. Okay. Maybe a uh, Scott question. Yeah, maybe a Scott question. I know what Rob the, would be able to answer it. Yeah, we're not going to go get him right no, now. No, 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 we're not going to get him, but we, yeah. can, we can fix it and come back to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. we can definitely do that for tomorrow's show, 100%. Um, but folks, that's going to be, ah, solar filter. Pekka wanted to know about the solar filter. Solar filter. Solar filter. Solar. Thunder. Yeah, let, let me do the voices, sir. Thunder, thunder, thunder. Thunder, thunder, thunder. Thunder, 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 thunder speedway. So when you buy a oh, wow. sun catcher, you give it options of multiple measurements. You have, so how you measure for your solar filter is you take your telescope that you just recently purchased and you measure, without the dew cap, the outside diameter of the dew shield. Outside, that means the outside, not inside, the outside. You want to know the outside diameter in millimeters of the dew shield. And then we have a drop-down menu in the Amazon carousel, and you pick your range from 78 to 102 millimeters. And the price will adjust as you and go. And the price does adjust. That is correct. That's a fixed price. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but that's how you measure for your... Yeah, in the carousel, it only lets us show one. It just lets us show the one price. Paul is correct. You'll end up getting, say, I got my solar filter, but I get all these, these weird triangle things. What am I supposed to do with these? Well, they're on Tacos. the inside of the solar filter. You have these little white double-sided sticky tapes that you put on. I would put on the blocks, and you stick them on each other, and then you put this on the telescope. And then for a secure fit, you make sure you just look at it, put it around there, and just eyeball it with a marker, and just draw a circle of where the telescope fits for a nice secure fit and then you cut it to what cut it you inside the circle to cut it inside the circle don't please 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 do not cut it with it on because if you puncture the filter you're done you can't do it you can't well, use it and on top of that and you know it's just not it's not, it's, it's not gonna work you know no it, so I, what you I need to be slightly inside of it that way when you go and put it over the sun it's nice and tight. Yeah, it's it's got to be extremely tight because doesn't, if you get it extremely tight, it needs to be snug. I think you need to get it as tight as you possibly can and still get it on there. Yeah. Because if you get a nice wind <laughs> and ah. you're looking through it, ah. now you're going wearing an eye patch and 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 you know. matey. Yeah. So that's that's how these arrive. So you measure the outside diameter of the dew sh or the dew shield, the dew shield or. Anything that you have in front, same with the Newtonian, you measure the outside diameter. And that gives you your, your in millimeters, it gives you the size that you need. On the drop down menu, again, the prices do adjust. We just have to be fixated with the 73.99. But again, for a 70, I think it's like an 80 to a 102, it's a lot lower than that. Um, I think the 73 is the big one. Like the big one, big one, like that one back there. Um, but it's a Mylar filter. Yeah, that's, the material is quite expensive. The material is quite expensive and because <coughs> we, we actually make it in-house. Yeah, all this is printed and assembled yeah. here. here. Now, the, the here. filter, Japan? Yes, we, we get the filter material in Japan. It comes, well, it, it comes flat to us. And big then roll we, or something like that. Yeah, and then we have a guy in the back that makes those, and he cuts them out individually and stacks them. And yeah, it's a whole thing. It is a whole, whole thing. But guys, that is today's episode on Amazon Live. I have to get ready to do my job now. And you got to do another video later. And I got to do another, another video later. I'm doing something else. Yep. So I'm Tyler with Explore Scientific. Thank you again for coming for Amazon Live. Please do not forget to hit the follow button if you haven't. And if you have, we appreciate you being here. Again, today's day is July 27th, which is a Wednesday. 2022. I'm out. See you guys later.
Watch that last piece, don't even. Have to.